Hey, Brad, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Looks like Evan's still getting signed on. We'll wait for a couple more people to join before we get started here, too. Hey, Brad looks better than I do. It's the beard. It's not possible. <laughs> no, he does. Look at him. Maybe you need to bring the beard back, Evan. Yeah, I suppose you're right. <laughs> I can't grow one or I'd try, so. Right, neither can I, didn't stop me. <laughs> yeah, you're in that other room. Yep. All right. Do I look tired, Brad? You do, or I do? No, do I? <laughs> not any, not any more so than I am. Okay. So we cancel each other out, or we double down on tired. <laughs> we need to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, are you tired? I'm doing all right. Why does this keep going away? Okay. <laughs> all this technology. Yes, great. Crazy. I did get an email from somebody saying that they didn't have a link to register, but people are hopping in. So I think we should be okay. Yeah. It's your show, man. I'll do whatever. You know me. <laughs> Let's just wait a couple minutes and see if we can get some more people to, to hop in All right. before we get started. How can it be my show if it's named Hangout with Evan? <laughs> well, it's because it was supposed to be Hangout with Bren Brandon, but they ah. messed up at the printers. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's Hangout with Evan. So thanks, pal. Probably don't want me talking about security for an hour. But. Actually, I think that'd be more entertaining. <laughs> Evan and I are just going to watch you talk about it. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Nope. <clears throat> so, Brandon, what are your thoughts on two-factor authentication? <laughs> um, it helps keep the bad guys out. That's correct. It can be a challenge. In That's what we should do. We should. Spending more time. We know. should play like a game show. <clears throat> there you go. It could be like Alex Trebek. <laughs> Jeopardy? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we'll host the Jeopardy for our next Hangout. How's that sound? Yeah, what is what is Chapter 6? I don't remember. Um, it is... Oh, I can't remember either. Put some in... gun. <clears throat> it's because... What is Chapter 6? Chapter 6 is... Oh, the herd mentality. That's what it is. Mm. <laughs> Sheep. Can you see it if I put it back here? <laughs> Do you see it? Sheep. That's right. That's only 8,000 words on that chapter. That's it? <laughs> on that chapter, yeah. All right, well, it's 2.05, and I don't see too many people hopping in still, so should we get started and hope that we get a couple more to join? How's that sound? Sounds good to me. I'll do whatever. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I know we've been chatting for a little while, but welcome officially to the July version of Hangout with Evan, and it's also Hangout with Brad this month. We got Brad Yay. and I, who's the... Director of Consulting Services here at FR Secure as well, um, and we're chatting about the blame game today. So it's some of the, you know, some of the factors that cause us to place place blame when it comes to working in the information security industry. And uh, so with that, um, enjoy the conversation. Feel free to you know use the chat feature or the hand raise feature if you have any questions that you'd like to bring up. Again, these are meant to be 
more uh, <laughs> more interactive than your typical webinar. So we'd appreciate if you were to share some questions and and comments and feedback and that kind of thing. So um, Evan and Brad, why don't you guys take it away? All right. Yeah, everything's funner with Brad. Hi, Brad. <laughs> Hi, Evan. We had lunch today. It was good together. Yep. All right, so this is Hangout. That means it's supposed to be kind of informal. Uh, we were just talking, well, some people were already joined in, but uh, we were talking about how we're tired. I think this makes me look tired, and I think it gave me another chin. <laughs> get a lower chair, get a better angle. If I stand up or down. <laughs> this <laughs> all right all right well this is chapter five uh the blame game it's almost like every time we we do this um i feel like i should uh you know do like one of those reading things where you have a bunch of people sit have you ever been to one of those before um, you know you've seen them maybe on tv i've never been to one before where like it's a the author sits in front of the class or whatever or okay. sits in front of a group and then reads the book oh yeah 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 reading. Should I do that? No. This is, it's your, uh, your hangout. No, we already settled that. It's Brandon's hangout. And All right, Brandon, Brandon's, what is he supposed to do here? And Brandon's left us, so now we get to do whatever we want. Oh, geez. No, I didn't, I didn't leave you. I didn't leave you. I just keep it on mute so I don't say anything dumb while you guys are talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is uh, – so you, I sent you this, this chapter – the draft this is the first draft so you probably read it and you're like man this guy's not good at words at wording did you did you think that um you didn't send me the draft <laughs> mm, I <don't> that. <laughs> did you i didn't see it uh yeah that's exactly what i thought evan <laughs> thank you brad i'm glad we're on the same page today <laughs> all right as you can tell i was a last minute ad I know, but we're going to add you every week because right. I always enjoy time with you, even if it's virtual. It's good to talk. And so for people on, online, uh, Brad does run our consulting services team. So we're on our, so we chatted. Yeah. Got to keep an eye on Evan. Yeah. Good, good luck. <laughs> Come on. It's totally not like that. Oh, so yeah, we have two sides to our business, right? Primarily, well, yep. okay, two sides, really simple, sales, operations. But then on the operation side, we've got two groups there. We've got the technical services team, and then we have the consulting services team. So yep. the technical services team, we keep locked up. The consulting services team, which is your team, yep. we let talk to people. We so clean up a little nicer. Yeah, yeah. So here you are. Uh, so this is this is chapter five. This is the blame game, and it's really about how I think it, it. Well, it's human nature when things go bad that we look to blame others, you yeah. know, before sort of accepting responsibility ourselves. The same thing happens every time you see a, a breach. You know, the Equifax breach was the one example that I really walked through in this chapter of the book on how um, you know immediately we all want to blame somebody. Right. And, and when you think about it, like just logically, no matter what we do, we can't prevent all bad things from happening. Right. So yeah. you sort of kind of should sort of expect bad things if you know that you can't prevent them all. Right. Yeah. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen. Yeah. And then it's this whole blame thing you know that happens so that sucks that you didn't get a copy of the of this chapter of the book because i sent it i would have sent it in that meeting invite i sent yesterday do you have it because then you can like look at what i'm talking about if not then that's okay i can read it we can well, do that book, book reading I'll, thing i'll look at this real quick did you find it let me see hold on um i don't, oh, I don't have anything on that son of a that's okay well, security is a lot of work. That's all right. All right. So the first thing, uh, well, I'll just uh, kind of go through it for you a little bit. It's more fun this way. It's a little more surprising. Mm -hmm. Well, I start off with blame, just what blame is and, and, and how it's a human kind of nature thing. Blame is an excellent defense mechanism. Blame is a tool that we use when we're in attack mode. Um, 
we're not, one of the reasons why we use blame is because we're not usually very good at figuring out the causes of people's behavior. So yeah. we assume a lot of things and that also applies to our own, you know, behavior. So it gets a little psychology ish yeah. in this chapter of the book, but it's still a problem. Um, it's easier to blame someone than it is to accept responsibility. Right, you that, have kids. Yeah. That's, that was always one of the challenges. Like when I had that realization working like, hey, you know what? Here's what I did to try to prevent it. It happened. Here's what we're going to do to prevent it next time. It was like, that was such a hurdle to get over. And then it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is easy. Like, it, it's not, it's going to happen. Just right. Do what you can to try and minimize it and move forward. I was thinking I was, uh, oh man, I'm trying to think of what the, the deep, the specifics were, but I was with my wife. Crap, I can't, if it comes to me, uh, but we were something, something was, something didn't get done or something. Right. And I, without even thinking, right. There was no intention behind it at all. Just without even thinking, I like, well, yeah, Marlis, or, you know, and, and she, 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 cause it, it's rare for me to do that. And then she was like, what are you talking about? And, you know, cause it, <laughs> cause it really, it really wasn't her. It was me anyway. Yeah. But it was, I got to remember those circumstances. Cause that was funny. Did the lights go down in here? And we did this last time too. Nobody pays the bills around here. And the fifth reason for the blame game is people lie. Do you believe that? Yeah. I, I mean, and it's, I, I definitely, you're such, nice, you're such a nice guy. Uh, I mean, well, if you think about it, right, people, it's like that self survival mentality out there that, Hey, if I take the blame for this, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to lose my job, but this is going to happen. So like, yeah, well, we, Evan told me to do this and I did what he told me and I never talked to you about it. You see that. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, I think some of those lies are kind of white lies, right? I mean, nobody, I mean, truly, yeah, nobody doesn't ever lie, right? So, I, um, I've i never lied, Evan. You just did. <laughs> oh, Andrew says it's too big to paste the chapter into a chat. Wow, how, many, how big was it again? I think we can paste it in there. I don't think you could paste it. That chat has a limit. Oh, is it limited by my computer? Uh, I have 16 gigs of RAM. It'll be like four hours from now when it finishes copying and pasting. Nobody's heard anything because you're copying a paragraph at a time. That sounds like a really easy hangout to me. <laughs> 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 All right. So the problems. Number one, no shortage of people or things to blame for our shortcomings. So it's easy, right? There's all kinds of scapegoats everywhere. I mean, it doesn't take long to find them. The second problem is we all live in glass houses. Isn't there some kind of saying? It's probably in this chapter when I get to it. Uh, he who lives in a glass house should be the last to throw a stone. Should throw the first stone or throw yeah. the first, something like that. Yeah. Uh, another problem, fear of blame and, and reprimand. We see this sometimes a lot when users do something that they mm -hmm. maybe shouldn't have done. And they're reluctant to share with us because they're afraid what's going to happen to them. Yeah. Uh, your your video oh there it, it was like frozen. Mine. Yeah. Oh weird. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good like a statue. It was a good freeze though. <laughs> your statue. All right. Uh, four. We're not ready. We're not good at or ready for attribution. Now, how many? This is this plays a big role when when in every, in every incident response. Even yesterday, you know, I got called into an incident response. I don't get called into them very often, but everybody was booked. Uh, and that was the first thing they wanted, attribution. Who, who can I blame? Who can I hold yeah. accountable? Uh, the problem is with this is we're not good at that and we're not ready for it. Um, we don't build our systems well uh, to be able to support attribution. Uh, faulty products and services with no recourse is the fifth problem if I were to summarize. The solutions define roles and responsibilities. Everybody likes that. That's fun. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. I'm working with a global company right now. Make sure they're not online. <laughs> Assuming they gave us 
names. Uh, I don't know. There's somebody called Viking on here. Nah, probably not. Ton. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, that's a problem, right? And this, especially, you know, the larger the organization. As an organization gets larger and larger, the more uh, important it is to define roles and responsibilities. We're going through that right now here at FR Secure where yeah. we've got, so, you know, almost 70 employees now. It was easy to find roles and responsibilities when there were three. Right. You know, and there wasn't a lot of people to blame when things went wrong. But now, as an organization gets larger, the problem just compounds. Uh, so anyway, uh, there's a bunch of stuff about, you know, um, the dictionary uh, terms for the blame game is actually a thing. Did you know that? It's actually a, a thing that's defined in the Oxford Dictionary. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so we start kind of there with what the blame game actually is because I wanted to make sure that you didn't think, you know, whatever. Uh, recent and famous breaches. So here's some headlines that kind of point our frenzy. And I, it's, like, it's like sharks in a feeding frenzy when something bad happens. Here's just some headlines. Senators want massive fines for data breaches at Equifax and other credit reporting agent firms. Uh, that's one headline. Another headline, it was Uber's big year for blundering. We knew that though. They kind of, it's hard not to blame some of that. Here's one Florida oncology company to pay $2.3 million after data breach. Coincidentally, that same oncology company filed bankruptcy after that. Uh, and I wonder that $2.3 million, would that be a, a, enough of a punitive damage to get, to have them get it right the next time? And we, could we then say, uh, you know, let's say they take, maybe they didn't take information security seriously at all, right? And so that $2.3 million fine was maybe warranted. Do you hear that? Somebody's calling the conference room while I'm sitting here. Should I answer it? We should get them on the call. I don't know how that would work. Uh, but, you know, so it's $2.3 million, that fine going to be enough to motivate them maybe to take information security seriously enough yeah. To where then we could say that you could prevent all breaches? The answer is no, still. Yeah. No matter how much money you're spending, you're still not going to do that. Right. So, I mean, it's just this, it's, I don't know, it's kind of kind of a catch-22. Yeah. yeah, that's tough. Uh, class members, RIP proposed $115 million Anthem data breach deal. And there's a headline, who's to blame for the Anthem? Uh, another uh, headline, Department of Homeland Security suffers data breach. The DHS said a former employee is to blame and not a hacker. Former Yahoo CEO apologizes for data breaches, blames Russians. Right? That's, that's an easy the way. Russians. Yeah. If you can't figure out attribution, just blame the Russians or Chinese or North Koreans or yeah. Iranians because it's probably one of them. Uh, so th those are a lot of our problems here. We have a, I wish my roles and responsibilities were defined. My job title describes 10% of my responsibilities. Yeah. You know? Right. So tell me, do you know any stories about blame when you've, have you been at a place where you've either experienced a breach or, you know? Uh, I didn't, not a breach, knock on wood. Uh, we had one early on in my career where uh, backup failed. We lost some, some, uh, a couple of hours worth of data overnight that ended up not being a really big deal. But I was told that, you know, by the head of the IT, I'm not going to take the blame. My boss was blown. Wasn't it's rolling downhill and <laughs> I was allowed to resign. So they permitted to, they let you I was, I was old. Yeah. They gave me that honor to, uh, to that. But yeah, it was a situation where they said, I'm not taking the blame for it. Somebody's going to, even though I kind of alerted them of the, Hey, this is a risk. Mm -hmm. I didn't follow through. I was still pretty young and didn't didn't realize the whole. You you have to get it in writing rather than just in conversation. So sure, yeah, but yeah, it's definitely been on the receiving end of kind of being the fall guy and taking the blame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can think of lots of times when I've been. Uh, I haven't been allowed to. Re well, I've been allowed to resign. Right? I mean, we're yeah. all allowed to. I was given the option of resigning or being terminated. It's really oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. I, it wasn't. There wasn't much option really there. It's the main. I've been, uh, I've been uh, chastised in front of a group, uh, 
because a, a vulnerability that I found was going to cost the company three million dollars to remediate. And I can't really tell you where because then you'll yeah. look at my uh, you'll look at my LinkedIn and find out and whatever. I don't need that. Uh, yeah, everybody's kind of got something to blame. So uh, here's a here's a scenario. Uh, because at this part, in this part of the book, really, it's the fact that there is plenty of blame to go around. You take a scenario, for instance, um, where a, a breach occurs uh, through a compromise of a vendor. Now we know that statistically, 63% of all breaches happen through directly or indirectly vendors. Right? So vendor risk management is a big deal. Yeah. Yep. Um, so a breach occurs through a vendor uh, who has provided remi remote access to the organization's network. So this breach occurs, think of all the people and all the things that you could blame. And so here's just a, a simple list. We could blame the vendor themselves for failing to periodically test the resilience, you know, an employee's resilience to phishing attacks, assuming that that's how it took place. We could blame the vendor for weak authentication. We could blame the vendor for permitting users to authenticate to the workstations as administrator. Mm -hmm. We could blame the organization or ourselves uh, for failing to, you know, vet out this risk in their process, including all the people that are involved with that. Uh, we could blame or is we could blame ourselves for is for failure to isolate the vendor's network. So when a breach did occur in the vendor, we didn't contain the vendor. We didn't have segmentation in our network. So once an attacker got in, they were able to pivot. You know, right. um, what have you. Uh, we could blame our organization's executive management for failing to give us budget or funding for our information security program. We could uh, blame the attacker, which seems logical. Yeah. Uh, for targeting the vendor uh, and then in turn attacking us, we could blame our security operations team for failing to uh, identify the attack earlier, right? To try to limit the damages. We could blame our incident response team for failing to test our incident response process for a better response to the breach so you can see there's plenty and no lack of blame to go around <laughs> right and so uh here's a quote you know from uh this is a phd so somebody who's really smart uh elliot cohen one of the most destructive human pastimes is playing the blame game it has been responsible for mass casualties of war regrettable acts of road rage you ever had road rage just me and you talking. Don't worry about these. Yeah, I, I've been upset at drivers, but I don't. I've been yeah. back. I don't. I, like it's over, right? I don't. Yeah. I'm not going to follow somebody down the road. I was uh, when I was younger. I'm, I'm like really old now, so uh, lots and lots of years ago, I was. Uh, I, w I was coming on to um, what was that? That was uh, seven highway. Highway seven, getting on to crap. Hundred no. 169. All right. So I was taking a left. This guy was taking a right. I had, I had the arrow, the green arrow, and we're getting onto the on-ramp, and the on-ramp was the red-green thing, you know, metered. And uh, so I, he had a red light. I had a green arrow, right? So like in my younger interpretation, that meant that this road was mine. Right. I took a left. He took a right at the same time. Well, he's honking and flipping me off and you know I got to reciprocate you know I'm not proud of these days and I was eating a breakfast sandwich uh, I don't know at McDonald's or maybe holiday or something and so we both rolled down our windows and started yelling at each other so I threw, I threw my breakfast sandwich and hit him with it <laughs> I've never done anything like that yeah so I don't do that anymore all right anyway that's a regrettable act of road rage uh, and then Dr. Elliot, or I'm sorry, Dr. Cohen continues. And on a broad interpersonal level, social, social, sorry, familial and work related, a considerable amount of human frustration and unhappiness all comes from us playing this blame game. Then I go on and on and on and on about that stuff. And then I talk about the Equifax breach. You heard about the Equifax breach? Equifax got breached? Well, yeah, I, I now, according yeah. to this, according to this author, yeah, weird. Last year, maybe huh. sometime around then. Yeah. 
but it resulted from a compromise of an unpatched Apache Struts vulnerability. That's well known. Uh, the vulnerability was months old when it was finally discovered. That's well known. Reports yeah. surfaced that Equifax had a patching policy that should have ensured the patch was applied to the vulnerable server within 48 hours. That was well okay. known. Uh, and so it's obviously had a policy failure and or process failure to support the policy the way same kind of thing. The patch was not applied. The process in the policy also outlined a, outlined a two stage process. One stage was to apply the patch. The second stage was to scan the systems for vulnerabilities to make sure the patches were applied. Okay. So all this stuff, right? It was a well, uh, you know, seems like a very formalized process. Uh, the breach happens, then the blame game kicks in immediately, right? right? Uh, we know that the breach response was terrible. Plenty of <laughs> plenty of blame to go there from the PR per people to the executive management to the people who sold their stocks and the people who set up the website that uh, yeah. was, was being blocked by phishing, you know, anti-phishing technologies. I mean, everything it was just yeah. crazy. Uh, you boiled it all down, though, through all of this stuff. And really, I think three people took the brunt of the blame. One was this unnamed individual that uh, when the CEO, former CEO Richard Smith, went to what's called on Capitol Hill, uh, he blamed it on a person, an individual who didn't patch the system that was supposed to be patched. And I don't know what happened to that individual. If they were ever named, they might have been. Richard Smith himself took, well, he retired? Yeah, yeah, he took like that a- That was the official. His golden parachute. And it's like you're, um, you can, we'll let you- We'll let you uh, walk. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to do that. And then the CISO. Do you remember the CISO? Yeah, I can't, it the, it was the big brouhaha was she had her degree in like music or something. Yeah, Susan Malden was her Thank name. Thank you, yep. She got just half, right? Yeah. I'd say, if I were to guess, half of the the world was like, oh my God, how could you possibly be a CISO? Right. You have a degree in fine arts and music composition. Right. The other half were like, oh, hold up. You know, a lot of us, that's how the best, some of the best of us are, right? Uh, but she, you know, this is... Uh, so many people did come to her defense, um, but it did really force her into hiding. Not only did she lose her position as CISO, but she also changed her LinkedIn page almost immediately to private and then replaced Malden with just M at the end in an effort to kind of hide herself. But that didn't stop the blame. That didn't stop this kind of rage that was building up against her. Um, one reporter, and I called it a trashy article, uh, claim that her identity is being scrubbed from the internet, which, uh, and it, because uh, she only studied music and composition. And I go further kind of into that. Um, that's part of the blame game. And that's part of this chapter where it's not constructive. Yeah, Holding yeah. people accountable is one thing. Blaming right. people is another. Right. Uh, and then hypocrisy is another piece that's that glass houses thing mm -hmm. a lot of that going around here we go those who live in glass houses should not throw stones that's a proverb yeah. used in several european countries see i don't even remember i'm writing this stuff i wrote it in like four months ago five months ago already okay yeah I, you know it's interesting going on you know the fact that she had her degree in fine arts and that, i saw something and i, I wish i I paid more attention, but it's like 40 or 50% of the people are, are doing a job that they didn't get their degree in. Mm, oh, it, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's incredibly common. So this is not like some sort of, you know, unique situation where it's like, oh, she's the only one who's ever done. It, it happens all the time. Right. Yeah. And I've had arguments too with, uh, the scholarly folk, you know, the academic folk that, mm -hmm. uh, well, you have to have a degree, you know, in information security, if you want to get, if you want to be, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like, no, I don't have a degree. Well, and then they'll use the false, they'll right. use the false logic of, well, you wouldn't have a doctor 
without right. the operate on you, would you? And I'm like, I'm not operating. Nobody, <laughs> di nobody dies. Right. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. And a lot more practical experience that, and, and real world experience that, that can compensate for that degree. Mm -hmm. Well, then on the glass houses thing too, I mean, can we really, I mean, if you know how information security works and you've really done this, uh, can you really blame Equifax for failing to prevent that breach? You know, I think, you know, if they, the way I would look at it is it sounds like they had policies and procedures in place and there was multiple points of failure. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you could say this is the one thing, this is who is to blame or how, what is to blame. It sounds like there's multiple things that kind of just got missed and that combination is what caused the problem. Right. Because, you know, when you think about the number of systems that they need to patch on a regular basis and you, f you think of just the sheer size of that organization. Oh, yeah and all the potential processes and people that have to play a role and they have to work in concert together. It's like a symphony and, you know, all these things have to come into play. And if, it, if, it, if you didn't employ human beings and I'm not advocating for AI by any means for, in, you know, in this case, but that's, that's the problem, right? right. I mean, it's um, in my mind, you really can't blame. Equifax. Maybe you can you can blame them. You can be angry at them mm -hmm. for sure. You can blame the response because I, I mean, holy yeah. crap, that was a terrible response. But yeah, you know, I mean, one missed system, and maybe you could you know things lessons you can learn. But it's always so easy to play mon you know play that Monday morning quarterback. Yeah, uh, I think um, I think you're right. I think the the response made it much worse on them than it really you know than it would have been had they handled it appropriately. Yeah. Oh yeah. What's Equifax? I wonder what Equifax's stock price is today. It took a big hit. Mm -hmm. I don't have it. Oh yeah, I do. It's 127, $127 and 15 cents. Um, trying to read left to right on Equifax. It's above where it was. Yeah. When the breach occurred, hmm. oh, it just popped in my head. All right. Uh, so other things with the blame game. So the blame game. Some of the consequences, you know, is you get this fear and reprimand piece, right? If I'm if I'm that user who clicked on a link and gave my username and password, we always say from a security perspective, you know, you got to report those things immediately so that you know, because there's a there's a correlation to the amount of time that you know the dwell time. And the and the impact that might we might suffer from it. So we're like, hey, tell us right away, right away. But they, there's still this reluctance, right? Yeah. Do you, have you have you witnessed that in in your, you know, in the work that you guys have done? Yeah, yeah. That's well, and that's one of the things we work on is is making sure that there is a like a PR plan and a media communications plan is. Right. Do you have you considered it? Because so many companies just they they're like, oh, uh, not sure. Maybe it'll be the president or a, who I don't know who's going to actually talk through these things. And that's, you know, yeah. How, how do we communicate this out and understand what when is the right time to do it? Right. You know, if you speak too soon and you don't know anything, know everything or know what's going on, it's going to raise more questions. You wait too long. Now it's like, well, what were you hiding? So, yeah, trying to figure out what that plan is, what the appropriate timing is. It's, it's definitely a challenge out there. Yeah. Have you ever been in the information security programs that you've been, you know, responsible for working within, just become real frustrated with users? <laughs> Never. <laughs> right. And so when, yeah. when, when something happens, I mean, it's almost like the default that, you know, stupid users, right? Right. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, think about the number of acronyms we have. Yeah. You know, for that type of thing. And I think, you know, and that goes back all the way back to chapter one, when we talk about speaking the same language, you know, if we yeah. realized truly, in fact, that they're the normal ones, we're the ones, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of flip the script, you know, it, it makes you realize that, you know, I'm not speaking a language they, they even understand. Right. It's not that they're stupid, but I mean, that, that all plays, you know, 
kind of mixes. How do you communicate it, right? What's the what's the message? How do we take this technical explanation and make it right understandable by everyone? Yeah. Do you remember uh, you read Hacks and Hops, right? Yep. Remember that guy that CISO? I can't remember his name. Sorry, I should have. Uh, but he really, he had a hall of shame, or I'm sorry, wall oh, yeah. of shame for his users. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I get why people do it. I understand it. But to me, like when we're doing, you know, any of the training, any of the fishing, it's not, this is an educational experience. This most of the time, this is not a malicious act by an employee. It's, they didn't know. And that comes back to failure and training management failure, not necessarily the employee's failure. Um, and we see that a lot too, where people are doing things and you're like, Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. And they're like, well, I'm doing what I was, how I was shown how to do it. And they, they just weren't trained properly. How is, how do you blame the employee for doing what they were told to do and not providing training? So. Right. And what seems like common sense to us isn't common right. sense to them. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. And most of the, for it. Yeah. And most of the time when you explain it and you go, Hey, yeah, you can't just write down credit card numbers and then put them in a file. That's not secure. You right, scratching it off with a single line through does not constitute like secure disposal. They're like, Oh, okay. What do I need to do? What should I be doing? Like most people want to do the right thing. Yeah. I don't know so. what they, they don't know what to do. And those one that's and those, and those ones that don't, you know, hopefully you'll weed them out and yeah, you know, because they're not probably not good for the organization. Yeah, I thought that was interesting when when you mentioned that because you create that culture of blame and reprimand and mm -hmm. shame. Uh, it really just, it's it defeats so much of what we're trying to accomplish with information security. Yeah, I, I, and I get it. I understand why they do it. You know, I mean, look at the HHS and OCR the the wall of shame for the HIPAA. Yeah, what does that look like now? How many companies are on that wall of shame today? It's big numbers. I was looking at it pretty recently. It's still a lot out there. And right, there's that argument of what exactly does it accomplish? I mean, people are just doing enough to not be on the list rather than, you know, going above and beyond for, uh, you know, recognition for doing the right thing. Holy crap, man. Yeah. It's... There's over... Five, there's 416 breaches on there on the wall of shame. What, like the last two years, I think, something like that? Yeah, I remember it was the first one was put on there. I can't remember the name now, but. And there, there's some big numbers. In, it's into the you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. They're not messing around. And I can tell you from firsthand experience in breaches, incident responses that I've done myself, where we, we've advised a company that, hey, this is a reportable breach. But at the end of the day, if you choose not to, you know, we can't do it right. for you, right? Right. Uh, we just strongly urge it, you to. Uh, but I've had times when companies haven't reported breaches when they should have reported breaches. You know, so that 416 it's, may seem like a lot, but it, it's not. It's, it's yeah. Not no. Really? No, there's probably more. And I wonder how much. I wonder how much that wall of shame. You know, that's not what they call it, by the way. What do they call that's it? That's not the official name, but that's what everyone calls it. You knew exactly what I meant. Yeah, they call it the breach portal. Yes. That's the official name. But the intent of that breach portal, what was the intent of that? You know, I wonder if was it was it to actually shame these organizations to uh -huh. or was it to hey, we're doing our job, we're taking public. it serious. If you yeah. I don't know if it's necessarily to shame. Maybe I think it it was Right, intended as a deterrent for um, for other companies. So kind of. Yeah, I wonder how it's working. That road. I don't know. All right, attribution was another thing that I had mentioned earlier, and you know, in, in most incident responses, that's uh, it's pretty common for people that want to know who who did this. Right, they want they want to know ultimately who is the one to blame for this or that. Um, but I can tell you from firsthand experience also that. Attribution is, forget it in most cases, right? It's super expensive. And what are you mm -hmm. going to do if you knew? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to go after someone overseas? It's just not worth it. Right. Yeah. 
Well, and then even calling law, local law enforcement, I've worked with law enforcement, I've worked with FBI and local law enforcement and FBI won't take most cases now because they're overworked and overloaded with their own yeah. caseloads. And then local law enforcement, you have to deal with their skill levels, right? Yeah. Which oftentimes is like, yeah, so I did or miss, you know, I had uh, my taxes were fraudulently filed a couple of years ago and I called and luckily I called the IRS and, and I tried to file like three days after they were fraudulently. So they hadn't mailed out a refund yet. So they actually took it seriously because they had the opportunity to set up a, a sting to get the people. But I had to call a lot, the local law enforcement so that I could get like the credit freeze and all that stuff because it's identity theft, right? Mm -hmm. They they couldn't care less. <laughs> they could not. He's like, okay, you have the IRS thing? Yep. All right, thanks. We'll look at it. N nothing. Never. <laughs> no I, I Whatever. I got my credit, free credit freezes and all that stuff, so I'm all set. But, yeah. Well, a lot of times when you follow, when you follow the trail back, you know, in attribution, you get to a point where you have to get law enforcement involved mm -hmm. because you need that subpoena power. Yeah. You know, uh, so for instance, financial fraud, you know, 13 uh, unauthorized ACH transfers, over $800,000 lost. The banks are all on the West Coast. Well, you get to this point where, okay, I know where the money went. Um, now what, right? I mean, right. That, now you have to have this, you know, subpoena, you know, to somehow get, you know, you can call the bank and say, hey, can you help me? <laughs> Maybe they that doesn't will. go very far usually. Yeah. So you get, you get stuck with that. All right. So that's more blame stuff. Uh, faulty products and services. Um, it's pretty common for people to be buying. You know, everybody's looking for an easy button. That's kind of the culture we live in today. Uh, and there's really no recourse when you purchase these new cool gadgets. Right. Uh, so for instance, you buy an IOT device, uh, and it's hacked and your privacy is gone, mm -hmm. whatever, I mean, whatever they did, uh, maybe they've been watching, uh, watching your living room for the last six right. months, including everything that's gone on and everybody who walked by clothed and unclothed and you know, whatever, that's a violation of your privacy. Right. What recourse would you have, you know, with the IOT manufacturer? Yeah. Uh, none. Yeah. And what, um, what, what kind of patches are they going to, put into place to actually address these. Right. Well, we're starting to see the same things with cars now, mm -hmm. commercial planes, uh, medical devices. Uh, I mean, lots of things are connected and so it starts to get a little scary. Uh, yeah. yeah. Quickly. Yeah. All right. So those are our problems around blame game stuff. Do you have anything to add? Uh, so I'm gonna get no. some ideas now on how we can, yeah, unblame game us. You know, I think my personal experience on that is really like, like, kind of, hey, figure out what happened, right, as best I can. You know, not try to blame game or try to put past the buck, but hey, this is what here it is. Here's what we're gonna do to try and fix it, and you know, take. You have to have some accountability. You know. And, you know, try and move forward and learn from it. And, you know, like you said, breaches are going to happen. So what can we do to try and prevent it from happening the next time or the next location or the next time, that, you know, the situation comes up? Yep. Yep. So here's, here's what Dr. I said that Dr. Cohen before, who PhD from Brown University. That's a, that's a good one, right? Isn't Brown a good one? That's Ivy yeah. League. Yeah, yeah. It's like the... Ivy League, right? <laughs> that way, somewhere. All right. So anyway, the blame game consists of blaming another person for an event or state of affairs thought to be undesirable and persisting in it instead of proactively making changes to, this is a big word, ameliorate. Okay. So, yeah. Ameliorate. <laughs> ameliorate? Ameliorate. Like that. Ameliorate the situation. Okay. So that's what I PhD from Brown, he used that word. Right. So that's what I underlined in the book was proactively making changes to that big word, the situation. So proactively. So what are some of the things that we can do to kind of 
to get our own houses in order, right? Uh, first res roles and responsibilities, mm -hmm. defining who does what around here with respect to information security and define them with as much granularity yeah. as you can, right? Try to take out the gray area. And just like anything that you document anywhere, it's, it's live. Right. Right. Things change, yeah. things, you know, whatever. It's a living program. Right. Absolutely. So number one, you know, role board, board of directors, what are their roles and responsibilities with respect to information security? Um, is that defined? There's all kinds of gov, uh, guidance around that. And I go through some of that guidance in the book, but board of directors has specific information security roles and responsibilities in any organization. It's whether or not they're defined and they're known to the right. board. Yeah. Right? Um, the CEO also has his or her own roles and responsibilities with respect to information security. Um, those also need to be defined and documented. And there's a bunch of stuff about, you know, what those should be and what those should look like. Say. So the board of directors, the CEO, and I, it's funny when I was doing research for the book, I was looking for what is a CEO job title, <laughs> you know, <laughs> For two reasons, one was for the book and one for me. You know, like, yeah. what, am, what, what am I supposed to be doing here? Are, did you find two that were the same? Uh-uh. <laughs> I didn't find two that were even close to the same, yeah. really. Uh, so whatever, you'll have to define that. But yeah. you know, in, instituting information security or implementing information security requirements in there is, is always a good thing. The CISO, assuming you have one, somebody in every organization has to be defined as being the person in charge of, you know, information security, even small mm -hmm. companies, right? Even if it's only a portion of their job responsibilities, right? somebody needs to be responsible for kind of the tactical and, and, and uh, making sure things are getting done, you know, from, from a security standpoint. So the CISO, uh, and, I, and I really only gave two big responsibilities to the CISO. One, provide consistent and quality information that enables the CEO and the board of directors to effectively make information security risk decisions. So you're a quality good. information gatherer, giver, interpreter, you're always providing that consistent yeah. information. And then the second thing is see to it that risk decisions are implemented in a manner that's consistent with the organization's mission and core values. One is, a, is communication Right. And the other is in implementing those decisions that are made by really that's it. Yeah. Everything else kind of fits into. That's those easy. Things. I'm telling you, security is the busiest thing I've ever done. They keep right. paying, they keep paying me for this. Managers, they have roles and responsibilities. What should those be? Uh, human resources has roles and responsibilities. What should those be? Uh, users. You know, and we simplify in a lot of our information security programs that we build. Really, if you're to simplify a user's responsibilities, it's to comply with policy. Mm -hmm. Right? Just kind of do what. Yeah. It says. I mean, the, the problem you run into is that you see so many policies where you're like, I, I, I've been doing this and I'm going, I don't, I'm having to read it three or four times to understand what they're saying. Right? So, and you're we, an expert. Right. How do we make these policies, if we're expecting our users to, comply with them. Let's make them so they can actually understand them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. One, well, and I, policies to me are have always been like rules for the game. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think of it as like, every time I walk into an organization and I, and I read their policies, I think of it like I just went to target and I just bought a new board game. Mm -hmm. I've never seen this board game before. I don't know how to play it. And I take it home and I bring, invite a bunch of friends over to play this game with me. There's only one person who reads those instructions. Yeah. Right. There's only, and that's kind of what policies are. There's really only one person who reads them, but then they need to be kind of masters at disseminating yeah. what the rules for the game are and making sure that everybody's playing by those rules. Um, so it's not like users need to read the rules, but they need to play by the rules. Yeah, that's fair. You know? And if they don't know the rules, well, then that's kind of on me, right? True. So, uh, yeah, all those responsibilities, good stuff, I think. Uh, and then we get to conceptual roles and responsibilities. They're conceptual because they're not defined to a specific person per se, but they're more concepts. Okay. Uh, these are things like information system, application, data owners. Mm custodians right yep. you see this stuff when we talk about data classification and all that stuff um, 
avoiding blame, looking in the mirror, little dose of humility. Um, would you say, you know, you've been in this industry for a while. Um, would you say that we're a humble industry? Uh, overall? Put us on a scale. Yeah. Which sort of side would it, would it? I, I feel like maybe there's a, a healthy dose of um, we're better than others because we know this stuff out there. Uh, and that, whether that's, you know, deserved or not, I, uh, it's a different discussion, but I, I think there's a, there's a fair amount of egotism um, yeah. out there. Yeah, I think that's true. I agree with that. Uh, well, that doesn't help either, right? Yeah. yeah, I've definitely, I've worked with, you know, CISOs or uh, security officers that were, it was, it, hey, I've got the title, you do it my way. I'm not listening to anything else. I've made my decision. I'm better than you. I've got a different title. I don't care what you've seen. Right. I mean, that, how is that helping? Yeah, and I've seen more than more than a few chief information security officers who actually had attained that kind of um, the pinnacle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they were reporting to the board or they're reporting directly to the CEO only to see them get knocked down a rung or two uh, because they they didn't approach it yeah you know, correctly so they yeah they were reporting to the CEO one day the next year they're reporting to the CIO who's reporting to the CEO right and if it's still not you know it's still not working then it's the CEO reporting to the you know that it's the director of IT it's the CISO reporting to the director of IT who's reporting to the CIO who's reporting right. to the CEO who's reporting to the board I'm like oh my gosh and I think a lot of that has to do with this failure to communicate well and this failure to uh to truly be humble right mm -hmm. i mean to understand kind of how these things work uh other things to fix this part uh transparency and encouragement uh i know you know motivating people to encouragement as opposed to a, you know hitting them on the head with a stick works a lot better uh attribution uh if attribution is ever going to be something that we're ever going to wish to have then we need to build better systems at a time, and I equate that back to the foundation. We talked about the foundation, the foundational components of an information security program, things like asset management, access control, configuration control, change management, those things that are foundational that lay, the, everything else lays on top of it. Um, if you ever want to get to attribution, you have to get the foundation correct. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, you know, yeah. it, it's a lot of point back to that. Everybody wants to jump right past that because nobody likes writing policy and procedures too. Well, in asset management, right? That's just yeah. the funnest thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, foundations in buildings and foundations in security programs, foundations in general are not sexy and they're right. not fun, you know. Um, accountability and just explaining the difference between, between accountability and blame, right? Holding somebody mm -hmm. accountable versus pointing fingers and blaming them. Uh, blaming Very makes different. you feel isolated. Accountability makes you feel coached, makes you feel right. you know, it's more inviting. And, it, and it's a different approach. Uh, and then product and service providers, there's plenty to say about them as well. And that is this chapter. You got seven minutes. I wish it only took me seven, like 53 minutes to write that chapter. <laughs> yeah, I that's can't, a, that's a lot in there. I know, and you know the the ghostwriter, um, you know that's going through it now. <laughs> he like takes it and makes it. I don't know, even thinner than it is somehow. I yeah, it, it, I, I, I don't know how you wrote a book like that. I that's just not my strength. I don't, I don't either, man. You know, I was hallucinating most of the time, not because of drugs or anything like that, just because I didn't sleep. Yeah, <laughs> the words just start blurring together. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take whatever questions. Does anybody have any questions, anything they want to ask, uh, or anything they want to add to you know our discussion that we've had today? We always like hearing from you guys. We won't blame anyone. Yeah, I see like Brad like every day, pretty much. I mean, I, I don't. I'm not complaining. I'm saying it's, it's, you know. I, I'm always open to hearing other people's uh, side of things. For sure, right? Yeah.
Always? You use the word always. Did always. you mean always? Always. I'm always open to hearing it. Doesn't mean I'm going to accept it, but I'm always open to hearing it. Okay. Okay. Hi, guys. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Maybe is it more Michael? Uh, Who is that? Steve Ballard. Oh, hi, Dave. Steve, yeah. So, Steve. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, it's okay. I've been on uh, a lot of security projects, uh, infrastructure, you know, controls, mitigation, the last several years. And you, you mentioned something very important the being able to attribute and then act on the identification of what things were attributed to. Nobody wants to do that. Right. I mean, I mean that's, there, there are consequences, you know? Yeah. Well, I think most people yeah. uh, aren't even capable of doing it. Right. I mean, would you agree with that too, Steve? And not only do they not maybe want to, well, I think they want to, but they don't really know all that goes into it. And once they kind of figure out all that goes into it, then they don't want to anymore. Well, I would agree. Uh, it, it's bigger than everybody, and I don't think they really know where to start. There, there's some perceived risk in doing that. There's obviously expense in personnel, time, research. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I, I don't know what the answer is for that. Yeah, well, I know that when we start down the path of, of attribution, uh, you know, it's collecting evidence. What things can we use to bring us? You know, it, it's just like... Um, any other it's like a physical crime scene it's the same kind of mm -hmm. concept it's build a timeline you know preserve the evidence uh, figure out who came and went and what changed and um, but really important things in that evidence are things like log files and most people don't have a secure configuration where they've they've preserved log files well um, mm -hmm. or logging on the firewall isn't you know isn't isn't either isn't configured at all or it's not configured well or I mean, it's just a lot of that. A lot of times we don't get brought into an incident response until months later. Right. I think the That's average. Exact, we're, we're exactly, you're like, oh, I'm going to go back. And you, you're like, oh, well, it, it goes back at least four months. And that's where your logs end. There's no way to figure this, go any further. Right. Yeah. And, and I think the last, I, there's studies all the time about this average dwell time before and an incident is detected. And I think the average, the last one I saw was 170 days. Yeah, so, so I'm, I was gonna say that run around 200 days, so. That's what I hear all the time. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, attribution, we're gonna have to shorten those things quite a bit and do things better. Good, good, good insight though, I appreciate that. So what else is new? We've got, uh, according to this, my next meeting doesn't start for two minutes. Yeah, same here. I see some common names in the participant field. I just wonder if they're going to speak up. Michael asked, he doesn't know what the, uh, he said this privately, um, the name of the book. So the name of the book right now, pending what the publisher changes it to, is The Information Security Industry is Broken. That's the title. It's a good thing you don't like ruffling feathers. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. Tell the truth. I, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be some people. Well, everybody wants to argue. Well, I, I, you've talked about it, right? There, there's so much people that are in it just for the money, and now you start calling it out and saying, here's what's really going on. It's going to stir, stir some things up because it's going to make them uncomfortable. Yeah. One of the answers that really cracks me up and you find out, uh, well, it, yeah, we knew it was broken, but it was the guy before it knew so he did it that way. They, they did it that way before us. Yeah, uh -huh. you hear that a lot just beyond this forum here, but I'm not going to say anything else about that. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you do it that way? Because we've always done it that way. Oh, gosh. Oh, That's my, okay. one of my biggest. Uh, yeah, I don't like when people use that one. Yeah. Because it's fine if you've always done it that way, assuming nothing ever changed. Right. You've done it that way for 15 years and never identified changes? All right. Well, it's funny. Here's a question that I asked um, on LinkedIn. I'm trying to, oh, crap. Where did I put it? So I asked a question on LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. What are some of the reasons why our words, advice don't resonate well with normal people? Uh, all answers, opinions, welcome. And I put normal in quotes. And so I was just, you know, whatever. I'm interested in hearing 
what people say. And one of the one of the responses that was listed, I thought was interesting because it tells us, I think, a little bit more about our human nature. But uh, the response is, can you clarify what you mean when you say our? What is our and normal people? Who are the normal people in this context? Because I'm looking at the question, how the question creates a we versus them scenario might be mm -hmm. one of the reasons. So yes, we're different, but I didn't say we versus them anywhere right. in my question. Why do we jump to that? I thought that was interesting. We versus them. It was, you know, that was never implied. It was just, there's normal people and then there's us. Yeah. We are different. We think differently. We do things differently. I yeah. assume, I mean, at least most no. of the people I know. I'm, I'm with you. Like I so just moved recently and was telling people what I did and they're like, Whoa, slow down. Okay. For layman, what do all those acronyms mean? And to me, you know, PCI and SOC2 and HIPAA, this is just what we do every day. And they're, they're like, you, you've lost me. Just totally didn't even, didn't register. And I'm, I usually try to be pretty good at that. Right. And just all you got to do to, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Forget it. Like, I go too far down that. Yeah, that, well, we're going to get yelled at. Somebody's trying to get in this room. Okay. Uh, well, two, we'll two talk things. to marketing on those shirts. Yeah. Well, you want to see my shirt? Mine says uh, Memphis Barbecue from when I was in Memphis last time. There you go. I'm representing barbecue. Uh, and then Shelly said privately, with the board game you'd be buying? Sorry, Shelly, even though you said it privately, it's, nothing's private here. Uh, you're buying Target called Risk? Maybe. I do enjoy Risk. It's a fun game. I'll play risk with anybody if anybody wants to come yeah. over and play. Uh, yeah. Oh, and, and then Shelly wants one of those shirts. Yeah. We, you know what? Here's the thing. Shelly has been, uh, and a lot of these people uh, that are online have, are loyal listeners. They've been here like regularly. I mean, seriously, we should, we should look into getting shirts for these, these folks. So if you yeah. want to email, Brandon, what's your, what's your email address? B. It's B Mattis, M A T I S, at frsecure.com. I'll actually throw that in the chat right now. All right. So if you email him with your size, <laughs> yeah, we're going to figure out a way to get you a shirt. Evan says that it has to happen. So that's well, and, and I see that James Williams, our president, he's online too. He, uh, he's a marketing genius. So he knows, you know, this is a marketing thing. It's good for us. Hey, it's like a free billboard, you know? There you go. All right. Well, I think if there's no more questions, uh, we're a little bit past time here, so we should probably get wrapping up. Um, thank you for everybody that, that joined us this afternoon. Thanks, Evan, as always. Thanks, Brad, for, for joining us today. I hope you all appreciated the conversation and, and got a lot out of it. So um, be on the lookout for an email. It'll contain um, a link to watch the recording in case you want to go back and um, check anything out or review it or pass it along, feel free to do that. And then um, be on the lookout for um, postings for next month's Hangout too as well as we continue to try to keep this rolling and uh, have Evan, you know, kind of chat about his book and some of the things that he's learned in the information security over his, his interesting career. So interesting. thank you and yeah. have a good afternoon. All right. Herd mentality next, next time. That'll yeah, let's fun. do it. Hey, great right. job, guys. Thanks. Take Thanks. care.